Between 1979 and 1981, Atlanta was plagued by a series of murders that claimed the lives of at least 28 children and young adults. Wayne Williams, a suspected serial killer, is currently serving a life sentence for the 1981 murders of two men in Atlanta, Georgia. While Williams was never tried for the additional murders, he is widely believed to be responsible for the Atlanta child murders of 1979 to 1981. Despite his conviction, doubts persist among many who question whether Williams truly was the perpetrator behind these tragic deaths. Hello and welcome to Maya's Reality Channel, where we bring you compelling true crime stories. From unsolved mysteries to notorious criminals, we leave no stone unturned as we navigate the dark corridors of real-life crimes. So, don't forget to give us a thumbs up and hit the subscribe button for more. Now, let's get back to the story. For two years, the bodies of black children were discovered in the forests and waterways of Atlanta, Georgia. Over two dozen victims, predominantly strangled, had fallen prey to this disturbing trend. As the death toll increased, the question on everyone's mind was, is Wayne Williams really responsible for these heinous crimes, and if he is then what could have been his motive? Wayne Bertram Williams was born on May 27, 1958, in Atlanta, to Homer and Faye Williams in the Dixie Hills neighborhood of southwest Atlanta, Georgia. Both of his parents were teachers, and he was their only child. Williams excelled in school, and was even called a virtual genius by his teachers and classmates. He demonstrated his business skills when he constructed his own carrier current radio station and began frequenting stations Wigo and Walk, where he befriended a number of the announcing crew and began dabbling in becoming a pop music producer and manager. Wayne garnered attention when Jet Magazine wrote about him. After finishing high school in 1976, Wayne Williams enrolled at Georgia State University, but didn't stay long. He seemed lost, trying out different jobs like radio work, making records and finding talent. Wayne also tried his hand at freelance photography, but nothing seemed to work out, and his parents later went bankrupt because of his expensive dreams. At one point, a neighbor told FBI agents that kids in the area thought Wayne acted like a police officer. He even carried a badge and told kids to get off the streets or he would lock them up. However, at this time, several kids have been found dead in different locations in Georgia. During the murders that occurred between 1979 and 1981, more than 100 FBI agents worked on the investigation. The city of Atlanta imposed curfews, and parents in the city removed their children from school and forbade them from playing outside. As media coverage of the killings intensified, the FBI predicted that the killer might dump the next victim into a body of water to conceal any evidence. Police staked out nearly a dozen area bridges, including crossings of the Chattahoochee River. Williams first became a suspect in the Atlanta murders on the morning of May 22, 1981, when a police surveillance team, watching the James Jackson Parkway Bridge spanning the Chattahoochee River, a spot where multiple bodies had been discovered previously, heard a big loud splash, suggesting that something had been thrown from the bridge into the river below. The first automobile to exit the bridge after the splash, at roughly 2.50 a.m., belonged to Williams. When stopped and questioned, he told police that he was on his way to check on an address in a neighboring town ahead of an audition the following morning with a young singer named Cheryl Johnson. However, both the phone numbers he gave police and Cheryl Johnson turned out to be fictitious. Two days later, on May 24, the nude body of 27-year-old Nathaniel Cater, who had been missing for four days and was last seen with Williams, was discovered in the river. The medical examiner ruled he had died of probable asphyxia, but never specifically said he had been strangled. Police thought that Williams had killed Cater and that his body was the source of the sound they heard as his car crossed the bridge. Investigators who stopped Williams on the bridge noticed gloves and a 24-inch nylon cord sitting in the passenger seat. According to investigators, the cord looked similar to ligature marks found on Cater and other victims, but the cord was never taken into evidence for analysis. Furthermore, 
Witness Robert Henry claimed to have seen Williams holding hands and walking with Nathaniel Cater on the night Cater is believed to have died. Adding to a growing list of suspicious circumstances, Williams had handed out flyers in predominantly black neighborhoods, calling for young people ages 11 to 21 to audition for his new singing group that he called Gemini. Williams failed three polygraph tests, hairs and fibers retrieved from the body of another victim. Jimmy Ray Payne were found to be consistent with those from his home, car, and dog. Co-workers told police they had seen Williams with scratches on his face and arms around the time of the murders, which investigators surmised could have been inflicted by victims during struggles. Additional fibers from Wayne Williams's home, vehicles, and pet dog were later matched to fibers discovered on other victims. The first clue came from a dead boy's tennis shoes. The boy was Eric Middlebrooks. His body was found in a rainy alley. Eric, a foster child, had gone out on his bicycle one night and was found dead by morning. Detective Bob Buffington found something red stuck to Eric's shoe, possibly wool. He showed it to his bosses, but they didn't take it seriously. Still, Buffington sent the fibers to the crime lab. A scientist named Larry Peterson saw their importance because it's unusual to find carpet fibers on shoes. Peterson worked hard to analyze the fibers and build a case against the killer. Despite reluctance to believe there was a serial killer, Buffington noticed a pattern of young victims. However, his boss dismissed his claims and threatened to transfer him, fearing panic in the city. Wayne Williams held a press conference outside his home to proclaim his innocence, volunteering that he had failed the polygraph tests, which would have been inadmissible in court. Williams was questioned again by police for 12 hours on June 3 and 4 at FBI headquarters and released without arrest or charge, but remained under surveillance. Almost a year after the death of 10-year-old Yusuf Bell, his mother, Camille Bell, finally got the police to pay attention. Yusuf was a bright student, but one day he disappeared while running an errand. Days later, his body was found, strangled. Camille was heartbroken, imagining all the things he could have accomplished. The investigation faced threats and even rumors involving the CIA. In the spring of 1980, tragedy continued to strike the streets of Atlanta, claiming the lives of innocent children like Jeffrey Mathis, who was only 10 years old. Similar to Yusuf Bell's fate, Jeffrey walked to a nearby gas station to run an errand for his mother and never returned home. As the death toll rose, investigators began to realize they were dealing with a predator who preyed on vulnerable children, luring them away when they were isolated from others. But by the time the victims realized they were in danger, it was often too late. It took a whole year before Jeffrey Mathis's body was discovered in the woods, far from his home. His mother, like Camille Bell, joined forces to confront the city's leaders, demanding action. However, the police dismissed their concerns, insisting that there was no serial killer at large, despite the mounting evidence. By this time, six black children had been killed, and four more were missing, yet the authorities remained indifferent. Sadly, it reflected a disturbing reality. Deaths of black individuals often received less attention and concern compared to those of white victims, especially if they were poor and Southern. The police were slow to recognize the severity of the situation, failing to establish a task force until a year after the first murders occurred. It wasn't until FBI profiler Roy Hazelwood arrived to assist that they began to grasp the magnitude of the crisis they were facing. John Glover, who became the FBI chief in Atlanta that summer, along with Hazelwood, believed the killer had to be black. They reasoned that the killer had to blend in with the black community to go unnoticed. This sentiment was echoed by detectives like Welcome Harris, who was part of the task force. They believed the killer could move around the neighborhood without attracting attention. The idea of the killer being black struck a sensitive nerve in Atlanta. It had been only a dozen years since Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was murdered, and while the city appeared to be integrated on the surface, deep-rooted inequalities persisted. Many in the community hoped the killer would be black, fearing the repercussions if the perpetrator were white or of another race. The concept of a black serial killer 
was unheard of at the time, as classic serial killers were typically portrayed as white. However, as people became more afraid, they started suspecting everyone they saw. Fear took over the streets, making everyone nervous. Kids were particularly scared, especially when cars drove by. The atmosphere was tense, with the feeling that danger was always nearby. Things were about to get even worse. The number of murders was increasing, with a new victim being found almost every week. The city was filled with even more fear and uncertainty as the violence continued to escalate. Many of the children who died were from poor families and often earned money by doing chores like carrying groceries or running errands for others. For example, Luby Gitter was selling car deodorizers outside a supermarket on New Year's weekend in 1981. His mother was worried about him going out alone, but Luby insisted he was a big boy and hard to catch. Luby was a good student in high school. On the day he disappeared, a witness saw him with a man and helped create a sketch of the man for the police. The sketch showed a man wearing a baseball cap, possibly with a scar on his cheek. Sadly, Luby never returned home, and it was believed that he was kidnapped. The police searched the woods around Atlanta, hoping to find Luby, but instead they found the bodies of two other young boys who had disappeared separately. Despite being ten miles apart and a month apart, both boys were left at the same dumping ground. With the death toll now at fifteen, the unsolved murders of these children made headlines across the nation and the world. The city announced a reward of $100,000, later increasing to half a million dollars. The task force received numerous sketches of suspects, many suggested by psychics. Meanwhile, at the state crime lab, Larry Peterson sorted through thousands of fibers. Nylon, rayon, acrylic, and acetate. A daunting task akin to searching for multiple needles in multiple haystacks. Then, in January 1981, there was a breakthrough. Detective Peterson found one green carpet fiber with a unique shape. It looked like a boomerang under the microscope, with three ends called lobes. This shape made it stand out. Peterson showed a slide of the carpet, but it was hard to see the color. He explained that the color seen under the microscope might not match the overall carpet. They used a special microscope to identify the specific fiber. Peterson now knew what to look for, but he didn't know where to find it. At that time, Wayne Williams wasn't suspected. He worked as a freelance TV cameraman and was trying to start a music group like the Jackson 5. He claimed he had an alibi when Luby Gitter disappeared, saying he was auditioning singers from 4.30 to 8.30 that evening. Kathy Andrews, co-owner of the studio, remembered the auditions, but the group never actually formed. The studio where the auditions took place was a small demo studio. The children he auditioned were around 8 to 11 or 12 years old. However, Kathy Andrews recalled a day when Wayne came in with deep, painful scratches on his arms. They crisscrossed both arms, looking angry. Kathy was concerned and asked Wayne what happened. He said he fell into a bush. This explanation seemed weak considering the severity of the scratches. Kathy's story added more mystery to the situation, suggesting there was more to uncover. A month after his disappearance, Luby Getter's body was finally found in the woods. He was naked except for shreds of underwear. The medical examiner concluded that he had been killed by a chokehold around his neck, with a forearm pressed against it. Wayne Williams was asked if he could kill someone with a chokehold, to which Wayne Williams responded, you probably could under the right circumstances. He confidently adds, I know for a fact I could not. Later, it's revealed that Williams failed a lie detector test, surprising him because he was convinced he could beat it. Later, 15-year-old Terry Pugh was murdered in late January of 1981. His body was found by the roadside in a rural area, about 20 miles away from his home. He had been strangled. His mother remembered seeing scratches all over his body, indicating that he had struggled with his attacker. Kathy Andrews, who was present, still feels uneasy about the incident. She doesn't believe Wayne's explanation that he fell into a bush, as the wounds on his arms seemed too severe for such an explanation.
The time between each murder became shorter. It started with 19 days between two cases, then 15 days, and kept decreasing until there was a new victim almost every week. FBI profiler Roy Hazelwood said this pattern is common for serial killers. They get bolder over time, taking bigger risks because they think they won't get caught. As more children go missing or are found dead, attention turns to Patrick Baltazar, a determined youth wanting to catch the killer himself. His stepmom, Sheila, worried about his safety as he involved himself in the search. Patrick, often alone, goes to places like the Omni Center where Wayne Williams offers auditions. Meanwhile, investigations show a pattern in the deaths of many young African-American boys in Atlanta. Despite Sheila's warnings, Patrick kept looking for the killer. Sometimes he faced threats and would call the police for help, but they didn't take him seriously. As the investigation progresses, suspicion falls on the Ku Klux Klan and the discovery of a nylon cord raises questions about its potential use as a murder weapon. The investigation into the murders continues, leaving the city gripped with fear and uncertainty. Here's the revised version, with the new information included. In February 1981, the police received a troubling tip suggesting that a member of the Ku Klux Klan might be Atlanta's serial killer. This revelation sent shockwaves through the city, raising fears of racial violence. Bob Ingram from the Georgia Bureau of Investigation took charge of the case. The focus turned to an entire family of brothers associated with the Klan, living in Mountain View on the outskirts of Atlanta. An informant claimed that one of the brothers had threatened Luby Geeter just before he was found dead. Detectives began surveillance on the brothers, tapping their phones and closely monitoring their activities. Despite hearing racial slurs and suspicious conversations, they found no evidence linking the Klan to the disappearances and murders of black youths. The brothers were called in for questioning and passed lie detector tests, clearing them of involvement in the killings. However, this did not halt the ongoing murders. Another victim, Jojo Bell, disappeared during the surveillance period. He was known to frequent a seafood carryout place where he'd often hang out. Witnesses recalled seeing him leave a basketball game and getting into a station wagon driven by Wayne Williams. In court, a witness named Lugene Laster identified Williams as the driver who gave Joe Joe Bell a ride. Williams denied this claim but couldn't provide an alternative explanation for Joe Joe's disappearance. Despite Williams's denials, the possibility of another child's death loomed over the investigation emphasizing the urgency of finding the truth and bringing the perpetrator to justice. A week later, amidst the backdrop of fear and uncertainty gripping Atlanta, two legendary entertainers, Sammy Davis Jr. and Frank Sinatra, arrived in the city for a concert aimed at benefiting the children affected by the ongoing tragedy. Wayne Williams's father, Homer Williams, a photographer for the black newspaper Atlanta World, found himself on stage engaging in lighthearted banter with the performers. Backstage, future mayor Kasim Reed had the opportunity to meet Frank Sinatra, an encounter he fondly remembered. Reed, like many other young residents, had actively participated in the search efforts, spending Saturdays scouring the wooded areas around Atlanta. However, even as the city came together for the benefit concert, a chilling new development emerged in the case. Patrick Baltazar, the 20th victim was found dead in the woods, marking a grim milestone in the series of unfolding tragedies. Authorities announced that they were able to collect carpet fibers and dog hairs from the victim's clothing, hoping for any leads. Here's the revised version with the new information included. The murders took yet another sinister turn when the body of a 13-year-old victim was found beneath a bridge over the South River. This discovery coincided with the sightings of Wayne Williams on the same bridge around the time of the disappearance. Witnesses testified to seeing Williams with the victim just before he vanished. As the investigation closed in on Wayne Williams, tensions escalated and the media frenzy surrounding the case reached a fever pitch. Inside the FBI headquarters, Homer Williams, unaware of his son's predicament, found himself in an unexpected encounter with the mayor's spokesman. Angelo Fuster, faced with questions about his son's involvement, 
Homer struggled to understand the gravity of the situation unfolding before him. Meanwhile, evidence technicians come through the Williams home, searching for any clues that could link Wayne to the heinous crimes that had haunted Atlanta for far too long. The FBI's top expert, Harold Dedman, led the meticulous search through Wayne Williams' home. Inside Wayne's bedroom, they meticulously collected clippings from a purple bedspread and a yellow blanket. Additionally, they noticed a distinctive green carpet on the floor, which would later become a crucial piece of evidence in the investigation. However, Larry Peterson, the state crime lab scientist, initially did not know about the bridge incident involving Wayne Williams. He was called to the FBI office to assist in searching Williams' station wagon, but wasn't informed of the specifics. It was only when he observed FBI technicians returning from the search that he realized the gravity of the situation. Peterson then decided to collect fiber samples himself, focusing on the green carpet. Upon examining the carpet fibers under the microscope back at the lab, Peterson had a breakthrough moment. He instantly recognized that the fibers matched those found on the victims, a revelation that left him stunned. Despite his years of experience, this discovery was unlike anything he had encountered before. Even with this critical evidence, Wayne Williams was allowed to return home that night, adding to the tension and uncertainty surrounding the case. The next morning, he called in reporters and TV crews, agreeing to speak but refusing to show his face. During the interview, he acknowledged failing a lie detector test, but defended himself, suggesting that some of the victims had put themselves in risky situations by roaming the streets without supervision. As days passed, the district attorney hesitated to bring Williams to court solely based on fiber evidence. Meanwhile, the FBI, police, and media maintained scrutiny of Williams' movements. In one tense encounter captured by a CNN camera crew, Williams showed visible frustration and anger, demanding that they stop following him, highlighting the mounting pressure surrounding him. Finally, on Father's Day evening in 1981, detectives arrived to arrest Wayne Williams for the murder of Nathaniel Cater. As he disappeared into the back of the police car, it marked the beginning of his prolonged legal battle. From that moment on, Williams would never experience freedom again. Despite Williams's denials and his insistence that nothing happened on the bridge, suspicions continued to mount. The FBI and police intensified their efforts, conducting night watches at various bridges over the Chattahoochee and South Rivers. Their persistence paid off when Williams was spotted on the bridge during one of these stakeouts. During questioning, Williams maintained his innocence, attributing his presence on the bridge to a misunderstanding. However, the discovery of a nylon cord in his car raised further suspicions, especially when Williams failed a polygraph test administered by the FBI. The test results pointed to his involvement in the murders, shaking the foundation of his steadfast denials. The trial, which commenced in early 1982, proved to be a marathon of testimony, lasting almost two months. It was a trial unlike any other, centered around fibers as the primary evidence. There were no fingerprints, no murder weapon, and no clear motive presented. Jurors faced a weighty decision, guilty, innocent, or the lesser known verdict of not proven. Williams faced charges and was tried for the murders of Nathaniel Cater and Jimmy Payne, both adults found in the vicinity of the Chattahoochee River. Cater's body was discovered nude, his hair muddied. Larry Peterson, sifting through the sediment, retrieved dog hair and fibers near Cater's scalp. Remarkably, the dog hair matched Sheba, the Williams family dog, while one of the fibers was identified as the distinct green carpet fiber found in the Williams household. Meanwhile, Jimmy Payne's shorts clung to yellow rayon fibers consistent with the blanket from under Wayne's bed. However, when Peterson returned for a subsequent search, the yellow blanket was mysteriously absent. The prosecution, allowed to present evidence from ten other deaths, attempted to establish a pattern. Fibers consistent with Wayne Williams's possessions were also discovered on other victims, including Patrick Baltazar, Eric Middlebrooks, and Jojo Bell, among others. Harold Dedman, presenting evidence to the jury, 
revealed fibers matching Wayne's belongings, along with human hairs inside Baltazar's shirt that were consistent with Williams's DNA. Similarly, Middlebrooks had fibers on his shoe that matched those found in a car Williams drove. Despite Williams's denial of ever meeting the victims, witnesses like Robert Henry testified to seeing him with Nathaniel Cater on the night of the incident, a claim vehemently refuted by Williams and his family. The jury faced a daunting task, considering the intricate web of evidence and testimonies presented during the trial. The fiber evidence, while compelling, also raised questions about potential manipulation. Jurors like Mike Durham grappled with the astronomical odds of finding identical fibers on multiple victims. Witnesses like Robert Henry stood by their accounts, placing Williams at the scenes of the crimes. As the trial unfolded, each piece of evidence and testimony contributed to the complex narrative surrounding the Atlanta child murders. As Wayne Williams took the stand during his trial, tensions ran high and emotions were palpable. On his third day of testimony, Williams exploded in a fit of anger during cross-examination by prosecutor Jack Mallard. His demeanor shifted dramatically, and he launched into a combative and confrontational tirade, declaring, you want the real Wayne Williams. You've got him. This outburst left observers stunned, including members of the jury, who were taken aback by the sudden change in Williams's demeanor. Reflecting on his outburst later, Williams acknowledged his own arrogance and admitted to being his own worst enemy during the trial. He recognized the impact his behavior had on the jury, realizing that his demeanor may have undermined his credibility in their eyes. Witnesses in the courtroom, such as Patrick Baltazar's stepmother and Yusuf Bell's mother, were struck by Williams's demeanor, interpreting it as an attempt to outsmart the court and evade responsibility for his actions. During his testimony, Williams referred to Prosecutor Mallard as a drop shot, a term meaning someone worthless or insignificant. He defended his use of the term, asserting that it did not make him a murderer. However, the jury ultimately found him guilty on both counts of murdering Nathaniel Cater and Jimmy Payne. Williams received two life sentences, a verdict that left his defense attorney, Mary Welcome, crestfallen. Despite the conviction, questions lingered about the true extent of Williams' involvement in the Atlanta child murders. Some believed that Williams was unfairly scapegoated, while others felt that justice had been served. In the aftermath of Wayne Williams's conviction for the murders of two adults, Atlanta's police commissioner made a decisive move, officially attributing the deaths of 21 other murder victims, mostly children, to Williams as well. This announcement included victims like Clifford Jones and Yusuf Bell, whose cases had remained unsolved until then. However, unlike Williams's trial for the murders of Nathaniel Cater and Jimmy Payne, there were no trials for these additional victims. For the mothers of these children, this decision left them in a state of uncertainty. Without the closure that comes with a trial and a verdict, they were left without a definitive answer regarding the fate of their loved ones. The lack of resolution added to the lingering pain and anguish they had already endured, highlighting the profound impact of the Atlanta child murders on the families of the victims and the community. Thirty years ago, DNA testing wasn't available. But today it is, allowing for the discovery of new evidence. For example, in 2007, two human hairs found in 11-year-old Patrick Baltazar's shirt were sent to the FBI's DNA lab. The lab found a DNA sequence matching Wayne Williams' DNA. This sequence was rare, found in less than 3% of African-American hair samples in the FBI's database, making it significant evidence linking Williams to the crime. This finding was considered strong evidence by the FBI's DNA expert, Hal Dedman, who stated that this type of testing could exclude around 98% of people in the world. However, Williams maintained his innocence, stating that while the DNA matched, it didn't prove he was the killer. Additionally, there were questions about Wayne Williams' past. He claimed to have undergone CIA training as a teenager, learning various combat techniques, and even mentioned being trained in the use of a chokehold. While Williams initially avoided discussing this, 
He eventually acknowledged some involvement with a training program run by the CIA, but refused to provide further details. Overall, the DNA evidence and Williams' past claims raised questions about his involvement in the murders he was accused of. However, despite these revelations, the courts had already found him guilty of the crimes. All right, guys, that wraps up our video for today. If you found this video informative, please do well to give us a thumbs up and hit the subscribe button for more.